Good afternoon. Welcome to the first talk in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering Colloquium Series for 2018. I am delighted to introduce to you Hannah Hajashirzi, who is an assistant research professor in the Electrical Engineering Department here at UW. So she's no stranger to most of the people in this room. Hannah has been doing uh, exciting work at the junction of natural language processing, computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, she does uh, really exciting and groundbreaking work in building on these foundations to enable artificial intelligence to start to do more than what any of these uh, single areas can do by itself. So I think we're in for a real treat with her talk uh, in which she'll be telling us about learning to reason and answer questions in multiple modalities. She's worked with a wide range of data. She brings together the amazing capabilities of end-to-end -end deep learning systems with symbolic methods that are designed to support reasoning and interpretability. Uh, so without further ado, welcome Hannah and thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Na. So thanks a lot for the introduction. In this talk, I'm going to present my work on question answering and reasoning about multimodal data. This is a joint work with my amazing students and my colleagues at University of Washington and AI2. Recently, we have witnessed great progress in the field of artificial intelligence especially in natural language processing and question answering. For example, we have seen IBM Watson beating humans in Jeopardy. We see Google search engine being able to answer a lot of interesting questions about entities and events, and it's mainly built on Google Knowledge Graph. Also, Question answering and interactive system capabilities have been deployed into nowadays cell phones and home automation, like in Amazon Echo and Google Home. These systems are great mainly because they are doing a really good job in pattern matching. But we really need to answer two important challenges in order for these systems to be fully applicable. The first challenge is to have rich understanding of the inputs. The second challenge is the ability to do complex reasoning. Let's look at this example. What percentage of the Washington state budget has been spent on education in the past 20 years? If you ask this question from Google, you probably see a list of web pages that are relevant to the Washington state budget. And it's the user's job to go over these web pages, connect all of them, finally find the answer to the question. But what we want is a question answering system to be able to understand that we are actually looking to find and solve that equation. And then it's the AI system job to go over different web pages to understand exactly what is going on inside those web pages, looking at different sources of data, like graphs, like uh, diagrams, tables, and so on, and then connect all of them together, do complex reasoning that basically requires multiple steps to finally answer this question. Or let's look at this problem. What will happen to the population of rabbits if the population of foxes increased? So this is a type of question that probably a 10-year-old would be able to answer by looking at this diagram, knowing that foxes and rabbits are connected to each other. This is a food web, and foxes are consuming and eating rabbits. But for current AI systems, this is actually very difficult to answer. In order to answer those questions, the system not only requires to understand what is going on inside this diagram, but also needs to know what it means uh, that uh, rabbits uh, are consumed by foxes. Basically, it requires some sort of complex reasoning to go over a large collection, collection of textbooks and also maybe look at some other types of structured data, like encyclopedia or, uh, for example, Wikipedia pages to finally answer this question. In my research, I have been focused on designing AI systems uh, that can address these two challenges. One is understanding the input and also being able to do reasoning. I have started my research career with uh, designing logical formalisms on how to represent data such that we can do more efficient reasoning. 
Then I extended those uh, formalisms to NLP and computer vision applications by learning those formalisms from data. In particular, I have introduced new challenges in NLP and computer vision, uh, some challenges like automatically solving algebra word problems or automatically solving geometry word problems. Uh, basically, these challenges are the types of tasks that 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds would be able to handle, but current AI systems can't uh, solve those problems. In order for an AI system to address these questions, I have made contributions to the NLP area to basically have better and richer understanding of a textual input, and also to computer vision literature to have a better understanding of visual input and also multimodal data. For the purpose of this talk, uh, I'm gonna focus on a task that is mainly question answering. The idea is we want to have a good and rich understanding of the input that can be of the form of multimodal data, usually a question and a context, and an algorithm for being able to do reasoning to find the answer to the question. Here is the outline of my talk. In the first part, I will show how we can represent data, mainly using uh, symbolic representations or neural representations. Then I'm gonna show my work on designing end-to-end -end and deep neural models for question answering uh, about multimodal data. And then in the next part, I will show how to use symbolic representations uh, to, do so to solve some AI challenges. And then finally, I show my future directions. When we want to design AI systems, an important challenge to address is how we represent data such that we can learn data uh, and that representation from data, but at the same time, we want this representation to facilitate reasoning for us. These type of representations can range from symbolic representations, like logical formulas, to neural representations. Let's look at uh, this problem. We want to design a system that can automatically solve geometry word problem. And I want to show that if we can understand the input to some sort of logical formula, uh, like what you see in, in, the, in, the, in the screen, then if we can leverage axioms and theorems from the geometry domain and do reasoning, we would be able to solve this problem. This representation is great because it allows us to do complex reasoning and then uh, solve these geometry problems. But at the same time, directly learning it from data is very hard. It, basically, this representation is too rigid to learn. What we want is to make these logical representations a little softer. Uh, for example, we can use different uh, formalisms that are available, like Markov logic networks, probabilistic relational models, or some of my PhD work on representing sequential data. But for the purpose of this work, we have focused on using probabilistic relations and then assign some probabilistic scores to each of the relations that we are extracting uh, from the geometry problem. So here, I just told you about how we represent the problem, and then later in the talk, I will show you how we can use these probabilistic relations to finally solve the problem. On the other end of a spectrum lies neural representations. One very popular way uh, and technique that has been used in the deep uh, neural model literature is to, do word, to use word embedding. And the idea is to see if the words that occur very frequently with each other be appearing in the same high dimensional space, or they appear very close to each other in high dimensional space. And this is called embedding, to map words into some high dimensional space. This has been very popular these days, and uh, people are achieving a lot of great results using deep neural models. But in order to achieve meaningful representations, we usually require lots of training data. And also because uh, they are not that intuitive, it is very hard to interpret and explain them, uh, it is much harder to do complex reasoning using these type of representations. But what if, if we can add some structure to these neural representations? 
For that, let's look at the domain of visual illustrations, or in particular, let's focus on diagrams. A lot of, vis type of, a lot of different types of visual data can be, fa can be found in a diagram form. So for example, we have diagrams in textbooks, we have diagrams showing us how to assemble a furniture, we have workflow diagrams, and so on. These type of images are inherently different from natural images, and they usually try to depict some complex phenomena that it's very hard to show just with a single image or multiple sentences. But if we use an out-of-the-box uh, neural embedding model and then try to represent these diagrams into some neural representations, that probably wouldn't work. Why? Because we're going to lose a lot of information that are hidden in the structure of these diagrams. Also, there are a lot of ambiguities involved in these diagrams, like arrows might mean different things in different types of diagrams. In one diagram, it might mean consuming. In some other diagram, it might mean water transformation, for example, in a water cycle diagram. So how do we tackle this is to build and uh, design a representation that works for a wide range of diagrams, and then this tries to respect the structure hidden inside the diagram. In particular, we introduced diagram parse graphs where every node in the graph actually shows a constituent in the diagram. Like uh, for the diagram above, you can see uh, there are nodes for blobs, for text, or for arrows. And then edges show how these constituents are related with each other. For example, there are intra-object relationships, a text describing a blob, or inter-object relationships, two objects are related with each other. And then later, we, sh we can take different components from the diagrams and then uh, basically encode those into some neural representation. Uh, later in the talk, I will show how we can leverage this representation uh, and uh, do a good job in question answering about diagrams. So I showed you two different ends of a spectrum for representing input. One are symbolic representations, which are great because they allow us to do more complex reasoning, but they usually work for specific domains. On the other end of a spectrum are neural representations, which are great because they can cover a wide range of input. Uh, and they are easier to learn if we have enough training data. But on the other hand, they are much harder for reasoning. So most of my work has been uh, focused on making the logical formalisms a little bit softer or neural representations more structured. Uh, and in future, I really like to be able to combine these directions. Let's move on to the second part of my talk, which is on designing neural models for question answering about multimodal data. Let's first look at this task in the textual domain. This has been also called reading comprehension in natural language processing, and it's a well-studied problem. The idea is uh, we have a question like which NFL team represented the NFC as Super Bowl 48, and there is a context paragraph given to us as an input. Then the goal is to find the answer to the question, which is going to be Seattle Seahawks, and it usually can be found inside the paragraph. A conventional approach to solve this problem is a pipeline approach. It involves a feature engineering step to map the question and the context to some features, like the words that are appearing in the question and context, uh, like the frequencies, their similarities, and so on. And then, train a classifier that tells us if a phrase is the correct answer to the question or not. When we apply this method to a very popular recent data set of question answering, this method achieves about 50 to 3 percent accuracy on how it can solve these problems. And as you see, it, there is a large gap between uh, this pipeline approach and humans' performance. And we believe that the reason is there is a disconnect between the feature engineering or the representation and also how we design the classifier. Also, we think that these features do not do a good job of representing the text or uh, the interaction between the question and the text. 
So what we have done is to introduce a neural approach to address this problem. What we want is to map the question and context into some neural representation and then at the same time learn a function that assigns a really high score to the correct answer of the question. Basically, this function has a domain and a range. The domain would be the uh, neural representations from the question and context, and the output is a distribution over the words appearing in the context, such that the correct phrase like Seattle Seahawks gets a good and gets a higher score. But how do we learn such a function and representation? Let's look at the similarity information between the question and the context paragraph. What we want is to find what words or phrases in the context are really important in answering the question. Let's look at this phrase, National Football Conference. This is probably an important phrase. It is relevant to NFL, to NFC, and Super Bowl 48 in the question. But then let's look at another word, uh, defeated, in the context. This is probably a less important question or a less important word to uh, understand and because it is only relevant to something like represented in the question. This is called an attention mechanism and it has been very popular these days in both NLP and computer vision. I can very loosely define an attention mechanism by through using uh, human visual attention. For example, if I want to see uh, and I want to focus on the stop sign on this image, uh, we basically look at certain parts of this image with high resolution where the stop sign is located and the other parts of the image with lower resolution. So basically I'm going to look at the most important parts of the image. So this has been used in NLP in other tasks like machine translation and other tasks as well. Most of the time, the attention is usually looked at, being looked at, looked at this direction, like uh, the attention from the context paragraph to the question. But what we observed in this work is that the attention, it is important to look at it from the other direction as well. Let me give you some insight and then I will dig into the details. For this direction, we want to see for every word in the question or every phrase in the question, what are the most important parts of the context or what are the critical information from the context. For example, NFL teams would be related to Seattle Seahawks and Denver Broncos because both of them are uh, teams uh, in the NFL. But then let's look at another phrase like NFC. It is more likely being relevant to National Football Conference, but the thing is it is more relevant to Seattle Seahawks compared to Denver Broncos. Why? Because Seattle Seahawks is part of NFC, while Denver Broncos is not. So this actually will help us to have higher score for the correct answer to the question. So here are the details of how we implement the attentions. We first compute a similarity matrix between all the words that are appearing in my context paragraph and all the words in the question. Then for the, every word in the context, I compute the distribution of how it is similar to the words in the question. And then I have a, a weighted combination of all the words in the question for the context word. Now I have a new distribution over the context word. For the second direction, what we do is again to build on this similarity information between the question and context words. But this time, we're going to look at every word in the question and compute its distribution to how much it is similar to the words in the context. So now we have one distribution with respect to the question word, we have another distribution with respect to the orange word, and then aggregate all of those, now we have a new distribution uh, that represents how important the context words are for us to answer the question. So this is great. We have been able to bring in information from the question side and have a better representation of the context paragraph. But what is missing is how we can incorporate information from the structure and the sequential nature of the sentences. 
In particular, we added uh, this uh, new function that basically tries to encode the structure and sequential information from the context uh, and see how these are interacted with each other. And then finally, this will be the output of our system uh, scoring the phrases. Or more particularly, we have introduced a deep neural model called bidirectional attention flow. This is a hierarchical uh, architecture that has different layers. These layers are designed such that they add a richer understanding of the input. And basically, we have uh, representations of the input at different levels of granularity uh, according to these different layers. And here is the detailed architecture of our system. Uh, don't get scared of this uh, diagram, but what it mainly shows is that each of these nodes uh, try to represent words into some neural representations. We have different layers that each layer is responsible to capture some information about the context and the question. For example, we have character embedding layer uh, that tries to deal with unknown words in the vocabulary. We have attention flow layer that tries to bring in information from the question. And we have modeling layer that tries to capture uh, a structure of the sentence into building the representation. Now that we have a representation, we pass all of these to an output layer that can change according to different uh, applications. But for the purpose of this particular uh, task, we wanted to compute the distribution uh, over where the start index of the phrase is or where the end, uh, end index of the phrase is located. Basically, we predict P of a start and P of n distributions. Then at training phase, we bring in training data and we optimize this objective function, which is uh, maximizing the log probability that these predicted distribution, P of a start and P of n, are actually assigning high score to the ground truth start index and ground truth end index, or in particular, y start and y index. And then once we do training, we basically learn the parameters and then use the model in action. At test time, we, the input to the system are again the question and the context paragraph. We apply our neural model, uh, again, uh, all the layers with all the learned parameters, and now we find out what is the most likely phrase that is the answer to the question. Let's see how our model works in practice. We evaluated this model in a very popular question answering data set that includes about 100K questions and paragraphs, uh, and they are all most popular uh, articles from Wikipedia. And we evaluated on how well we could answer the questions. Uh, as of January 1 last year, we were a state of the art, and we were the first on uh, this leaderboard, on this question answering leaderboard. And our system was able to achieve about 81% accuracy. And uh, the reason that we are higher with respect to other teams, we believe uh, that uh, this, uh, we, we leverage this uh, bidirectional attention. Also, this hierarchical nature, or this modular nature of our representation, and our model is helping a lot uh, with capturing more insights about the input. So since then, uh, a lot of teams are competing in this domain. And uh, so now, these days, there are about 60, 70 teams on the leaderboard. Uh, and some of it are built based on our model. Some are completely different systems. But it is interesting that best model now, or at least as of January 1, 2018, uh, is actually building on our BIDAF by adding uh, Luke's new word embeddings, Elmo, uh, and it gets about 85% accuracy. We have also evaluated BIDAF on other data sets. Some of it has been done by uh, my group and some of it by other researchers uh, in other places. Uh, basically, we have achieved a state of the art on, an art uh, on a set of articles from CNN where the question answering is in a form of closed style task. Uh, a state of the art on some other Wikipedia question answering data sets, a zero shot relation extraction data set, and a new data set that requires multi hop reasoning. We also uh, try to incorporate such similar ideas into another modality. In particular, we showed that 
if we add a little bit more structure to these neural representations, we are able to leverage similar ideas into a diagram question answering task. In particular, we introduced this challenge of answering questions about diagrams that are taken from textbooks. We have collected about 15K questions and diagrams, uh, and we have questions like this. Uh, in, in this uh, food web, uh, we want to see how many consumers consume kelp, or some questions like this, what happens to the water in the sea in a sunny day? So there are different varieties of questions. There are a lot of ambiguities. So this is obviously more challenging than just question answering about uh, only language modality. So here is the architecture of our system. We basically applied a similar setup to uh, understand questions and map them to some neural representations. Then we build our dependent, uh, dependency graphs, or uh, basically the diagram uh, parse graphs, uh, show this, uh, add some structure to diagram representation, take different components of the diagram, uh, and code them into some neural representations. And then compute their attention, how they are similar with, with each other, and then answer questions. Our results are promising. Um, our method, with respect to another method that uh, uses uh, only deep neural models without this uh, structured representation, we achieved almost 15% uh, better results, and uh, we, we, we got this significant gain. And our system is able to answer these type of questions, like the diagram depicts the life cycle of what, or how many stages of growth does the diagram depict? Like, uh, the second one is more difficult. It requires to have a better understanding of the diagram. Let me show you a demo of my system on how we answer questions about textual data. So uh, you, I hope you all see the demo. Uh, so the input to the system are a paragraph and a question, and then we submit and want to see how we answer the question. Let me show you some examples. The first paragraph is about Nikola Tesla. If I ask this question, in what year Nikola Tesla was born, if I submit, it will give me 1856. And it's pretty interesting because uh, there is no explicit mention anywhere, but you see that the first number in the parentheses is 1856. Uh, and our system is able to learn that usually the first number is associated with uh, the birth year. Let's look at another question that requires richer understanding of the uh, question. Uh, the document, is, the article is about intergovernmental panel on climate change. Uh, I can ask this question, why, what organization is the IPCC part of? If I submit the, answer, uh, the question, it will give me United Nations, which is right. Uh, and as you can see, here is the hint. Uh, IPCC is a scientific intergovernmental body under the auspices of the United Nations. So it shows that we can do uh, kind of complex paraphrasing. Or let's look at another question that requires a little bit of uh, reasoning. Uh, this article is about a Rhine River uh, in Europe. And the question is asking, what is the longest river in Central and Western Europe? If I submit this question, it gives me Danube, uh, but there is no explicit hint, uh, explicit mention that Danube is the largest river. You can find it here. It is the second largest river in Central and Western Europe. It refers to Rhine uh, after the Danube. So basically, the system is able to do some single step reasoning to understand that Danube is actually the largest. Let me show you some mistakes that our system is making, because probably that's more interesting and show how we can make improvements. Uh, let's look at this article, oxygen. Uh, I want to write my own question. What does the element with atomic number eight belong to? So we expect the system to give me it's a member of a Calgogen group. Uh, understanding that an element with the atomic number eight is actually oxygen. But, uh, okay, the system makes a mistake because it just understands that this is oxygen, but like we require another step to understand it's a member of Calcogen group. Let me push on this re reasoning side a little further. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let me write down my own story. 
Liz has nine black kittens. She gave some of her kittens, uh, or let me give a number. She gave three kittens to John. John has five kittens. Then I'm going to ask my question, which is, how many kittens does Liz have? So the system is not able to answer this question. It finds that, okay, Liz initially had nine black kittens, but it's not able to do reasoning, understand that some number of kittens uh, are decreased from the initial number of kittens. So this is basically the focus of the ne next part of my talk. So just to summarize, so far uh, I have talked about designing a deep a modular neural model that can do question answering on wide coverage input that includes text and also uh, diagrams. The remaining challenges are what can we do when the questions require more complex reasoning, especially when the training data is limited. And that's the focus of the next part of my talk. I am interested in introducing new challenges that uh, are uh, that that humans can solve them, but current AI systems cannot address those. In particular, I have looked at the domain of geometry and algebra of word problems, try to design algorithms that can automatically solve them. Addressing those problems require rich understanding of the input and also the ability to do complex reasoning while training data is limited. An uh, interesting testbed to all these uh, problems that I'm introducing is uh, algebra word problem. Now, I have the story that I just uh, entered as my demo, like Liz had nine black kittens and something happened to his, the number of kittens. Now, how many kittens uh, does she have or did John get? Designing algorithms that can automatically solve these problems has been an AI challenge for a long time, uh, even since 1963. But the approaches that earlier AI researchers were, were was taking was basically using some rules to map questions into equations. But that does not generalize to new domains, especially because these algebra word problems are designed at a child's world knowledge and they can vary a lot. We can have questions on daily life. We can have questions on uh, shopping or science experiments. There are no prior constraints on the syntax or semantics that have been used in these domains. And we sometimes require knowledge in order to uh, solve some of these problems. For example, in order to compute the number of people who began living in a country, we need to basically know that we need to add the number of people who were born in that country and the people who were immigrated to that country. There are some words in those stories that don't matter much, like the word kitten can be replaced with many different things like books, toys, balloons. As long as we do it consistently, we should be fine. But some words like this verb give, in this story it plays an important role. If we replace it with receive, the whole story and the final equation would be completely different. There are some irrelevant or missing information in these stories. For example, the story tells me that Mary cut some more roses from her flower garden. It never explicitly tells us that these roses are actually being put in the vase. But it is very easy for us uh, humans to understand that uh, these roses are being put in the vase, but this is not so obvious for machines. There are ambiguities involved, like for example, for the first story, we need to add the number of games that are lost and the number of games that are won in order to find the total number of games. But in the second story, we need to subtract the number of balloons that are lost from the total number of balloons to find the remaining number of balloons. So, to really understand these stories, we need to combine all these sentences and understand these uh, sequences of sentences all together. 
we started this challenge uh, in 2014 with a few colleagues, and since then it has attracted a lot of uh, interest uh, in the AI and NLP community. And a lot of people are looking at this problem. So one idea for learning to solve algebra word problems uh, would be something like this. What if we directly learn equations from text uh, and map text to the equations? But when we apply this approach on a, a data set that are from fifth grade math question, questions, it fails. It basically gets about 62% accuracy. Our solution is, what if we get closer to how humans try to solve these problems? And basically, look at uh, all the quantities that are appearing in these problems as sets of entities, and look at the stories of how those entities are changed in different states, in different world states. So uh, let's look at this example. Liz gave some of her kittens to John. Basically, we started with uh, some number of quantities about kittens, uh, that was our initial set, and it had one container which was list, and then according to this sentence, these quantities are transferred between two different sets or two different containers. Now Liz has less number of kittens, John has more number of kittens. But not all the numbers that are appearing in equation strictly follow the ordering that, that those numbers appear in those stories. Let's look at this example. On Monday, 375 students went on a trip to the zoo. All seven buses were filled and four students had to travel in cars. How many students were in each bus? In order to solve this problem, we probably need to first compute this part, which is multiplying the number of buses, which is seven, to the unknown number of students that are inside each bus to find out what is the total number of students in buses. And basically using this, uh, this idea, we're going to represent uh, math word problems using semantically typed uh, equation trees. And the idea is every leaf in those trees are actually showing us the quantities and the sets that are appearing in the problem. And then the intermediate nodes uh, show math operators or show how these sets are being combined with each other. But all those intermediate nodes are also typed, meaning that they're going to be of types, for example, students or money or something. Then our problem now is reduced to find the best three that represent this word problem. The space of equation trees for uh, a given problem is huge, in particular for a problem that includes about six quantities, the search space is uh, 1.7 million trees. But the good news is we can compute the score of these trees in a bottom-up approach. Uh, for example, we can use and learn some local scoring function that scores all these subtrees, multiply all of these uh, scores, like the scores of all these subtrees, uh, and then see how they should be combined with each other according to the global information that we are getting from the problem. Basically, we reduce the problem of scoring these equation trees into learning some local functions that try to score subtrees with respect to some parameters, and also some global function that tries to score all these global trees to see how uh, these subtrees should be combined with each other. Then we learn those functions to learning a local function. We train a classifier. It's a multi-class classifier that as input, it takes a pair of entities. And as output, it returns one of the four math operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And the features that we are using to uh, train this classifier are the intertextual relationships between the two entities that we have extracted from text. And, those, and we also incorporate the semantics we have extracted for all of those entities. Then in order to compute the global scoring function, we have a discriminative classifier that tries to score a good tree versus bad trees. And again, the features, uh, we're going to take advantage of uh, global features extracted from text. 
For inference, uh, we leverage integer linear programming to generate candidate trees for us that are consistent according to the types we are getting from the problem. Uh, for example, we have some type constraints like this, that the type of the left-hand side of the equality should be similar to the type of the right-hand side of the equality. Our results are promising. Uh, compared to an approach that does not use this uh, representation, we get about 72% accuracy, about 10% uh, 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 gain. And even more recently, some other researchers have built on our approach, used reinforcement learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning, on how to do a better job on combining these subtrees, and they achieved about 78% accuracy on this test. These are some problems that our system is able to solve. Um, we, our system can combine set different uh, number of packs, like four, eight, and four, and then multiply them uh, by the number of bouncy balls in each pack. Or we can form a long a range of additions and subtraction, mainly informed by the words that are appearing in the question. Uh, we are still not able to do uh, to solve problems like this. That Sarah, Kate, Benny, and Elisa, it's hard to infer that it's actually referring about talking about four people. So in this part, I talked about algebra word problem, which is a new challenge in the NLP and AI literature. I showed how can we reduce learning to solve algebra word problems to learning to map text to math operators. And if I can solve this problem, it's actually a step toward how we can have an understanding about multiple sentences together and basically try to be able to have a precise understanding of this type of text and do a better job in question answering. Let's push a little further on the reasoning side and also let's bring in another modality. For that, we have focused on automatically solving geometry word problems. This is uh, much more challenging than an algebra domain because not only we need to understand the text of the question, like most of the challenges I described uh, also hold here, we also need to understand the diagram part of the question and also be able to align those. Understand that, for example, secant AB is actually referring to that AB line in the diagram. So I'm not going to go into the details how we exactly solve the vision part uh, or the language part, but just give you an intuition. Uh, I would like to go from the text and the diagram into some logical representation that allows me to do complex reasoning. And uh, obviously learning this representation directly from data would be very difficult. So what we do is uh, make the representation a little softer and then extract all geometry concepts that exist in the problem, like ABC, line DE, line AC, and so on, and then try to form how they can be related to each other, or basically find what are the possible geometry relations that exist between these geometry concepts. So we have something like uh, ABC is a triangle, or line AC and DE are parallel with each other, we might even have a, a wrong relation like AC and AD are parallel with each other. Then what we like to do is to be able to score these relations according to the text that we are observing from the question and also according to the diagram that we are observing from the question. For scoring them according to the text, uh, we follow an idea very similar to what I just described for the algebra domain. Uh, we would like to form a classifier or, or different classifiers such that they learn what is the best relation between two geometry concepts. And to compute the diagram scores, we would like to use standard uh, vision techniques, have some rough estimates of how this diagram would look like, and then find the accurate representations and then uh, score these uh, relations according to the diagram. And then once I have all these scores, I would like to align my knowledge between the text and diagram scores, uh, do an optimization task, find what is the best set of relations. But uh, this is also an important challenge, how we align textual and visual data here. Let me give you some intuition. We want to find uh, a set of relations that 
actually have a higher score according to the text and according to the diagram. Also, we want to cover most of the important facts that are mentioned in the text and the diagram. Also, we want it to be coherent, meaning that the relationships shouldn't conflict or shouldn't contradict each other. The search space is huge, like we have a combinatorial search space. But the good news is uh, we could form a sub-modular optimization function that allowed us to greedily select important relations. And we, uh, so, so our, our optimization algorithm is efficient, but at the same time, we get to something that is close to optimal. Then we have mapped the question in the form of text and diagram to some logical representation. Now I will bring in my knowledge about uh, geometry, which are uh, some theorems and axioms that appear in the geometry domain. Uh, I will do reasoning and then finally answer the question. Our results are promising. Uh, basically, we show that we can achieve about 52% uh, accuracy uh, on automatically solving geometry word problem. And we have achieved significant gain compared to just a rule-based system or we, when we only look at the text or the diagram. And again, it's very interesting to see that our system is able to uh, beat uh, actually an, a student average in automatically solving these SAT work problems. And, and yeah, that was kind of exciting. And there was a New York Times article about uh, featuring this work. So in, in this part of the talk, I mainly focused on uh, symbolic representations uh, for complex reasoning. And I introduced two new challenges. One was on automatically solving algebra word problems, the other on automatically solving geometry word problems. Uh, I showed that these intermediate representations matter, uh, but the main uh, idea was how can we relate concepts uh, in the math domain or in a geometry domain? But in order to form these relationships and classify those, we actually require knowledge about those basic operators, either in geometry domain or in the math domain. But the, an important question to ask is how can we generalize it to more complex domains? And that's actually the focus of my future directions. Uh, I would like to design AI systems that can, do rich, that can have rich understanding and can do complex reasoning on a wide range of multimodal inputs, including textual or visual data. Uh, there are a few components that I need to build in order to make these AI systems achievable. One is uh, trying to collect and acquire knowledge. Uh, some, of the, some, some parts of knowledge are given to us explicitly, but a lot of pieces of knowledge are hidden. How can we acquire those knowledge information and information for us to do a better job in reasoning? Another important direction I would like to pursue is how can we leverage uh, the benefits from symbolic representations and neural representations um, and cover a wide range of inputs while we can do complex reasoning? Uh, and also, in order to be able to make these systems really applicable, I want to design a scalable algorithms. And finally, I would uh, like to uh, take these into newer applications, like for example, in tutoring applications. Uh, some ideas of how we can collect knowledge, uh, a lot of important information are hidden, for example, about entity attributes. Uh, we want to collect information, for example, about object sizes, uh, but we might be able to uh, capture those just by looking at how they co-occur with each other, like usually dogs are bigger than cats and so on, by looking at multimodal data. Or how can we collect knowledge about events and their structure uh, by uh, looking at their temporal information that we get from a large collection, again, of multimodal data. Then, if we have these type of uh, knowledge extracted, how can we incorporate those into our systems? For example, we can uh, add that to our modular representation, have some algorithms for aggregation and reasoning while we have a new representation and new knowledge uh, resources coming in. Um, it is also very important to have a scalable algorithms to understand different types of input because 
uh, the input to the problem can be a, tech, a paragraph and it can go all the way to like World Wide Web, right? How can we design algorithms that can understand uh, a wide range of input and be scalable? One important uh, direction I want to pursue is borrow ideas from information retrieval uh, um, and try to hash candidate answers uh, that might be the answer to the question uh, and then use those for, for example, search engines and so on. But at the same time, we want to have a deeper and richer understanding. Another important direction is how can we read text faster? Uh, we have some preliminary results already, uh, which is on uh, incorporating ideas from humans speed reading and design neural speed reading approaches. Uh, and so far, uh, with our preliminary results, we show that we can get uh, almost similar accuracy, but with three times faster. Uh, I would like to incorporate all of these in, for example, tutoring and education applications. Um, this tutoring system is required to have uh, two important components for automatically solving problems or generating problems, and then interactions with the students. Uh, for one part, the system required to know the mistakes that the student is making uh, and explain them how to solve those. But on the other direction, the system can work as a study body with the student and try to actually acquire knowledge from the student and then help them to understand the problems better. Uh, we, have done, we have already done some preliminary work on generating word problems and collecting knowledge from students. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to this uh, part of my future work, which is I, I think it's very important. Uh, and the idea is how can we leverage both of these representations uh, and make them closer together such that we have more complex reasoning, but at the same time we can cover a wide range of inputs. One potential idea that I have is to design a network that can learn different reasoning operators. In particular, we can have something like this, that it takes the uh, world state, the current fact that we are observing, and a question, update the world state, and then reduce the query. We basically want to borrow ideas from logical reasoning literature, reduce the query to something that is simpler to answer. Let me show you an example. My current state is Daniel is holding the apple, then the observation is that Daniel journeyed to the garden. The question is asking, where is the apple? I want to update the world state. Now I know Daniel is holding the apple. Daniel is in the garden. But the important part of the world state that I would like to focus on is actually, where is Daniel? Uh, this, this is the important part that, OK, I want to simplify the query. And given, a, for example, a story and a question like where is Apple and a few information about uh, where Apple goes from different people, uh, I, would, I would be able to apply my network backward and each time try to answer the simpler query. Like the first one would be where is Daniel, the second one is still where is Daniel and so on. And we can even stack these different letters together, have a more complex reasoning. Uh, to summarize, uh, I introduced uh, two different methods using neurals and symbolic approaches that both of them try to go beyond pattern matching, try to achieve rich understanding of the input while we are able to do complex reasoning. Uh, I show that the neural models work well with different types of input. The symbolic representations can do great uh, complex reasoning. Uh, and in the future, I would like to integrate both directions uh, to, to, to leverage uh, the benefits of both systems. Thank you. We have time for questions. This is an outsider's curiosity question, but on the SAT, sort of the algorithm versus the human, um, do you have a sense of which style of question answering more benefits from there being multiple choice, or if they even leverage multiple choice in the same way or totally different ways? So actually, we didn't leverage multiple choices in our uh, setup. And I think if we did, we can could get better numbers. Uh, we, we basically, that's how we handle that. Uh, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. <laughs> 
So, uh, we, so I think if we did uh, leverage the multiple choices, we could even get better numbers because uh, we, when we did the reasoning, we translated all those logical formulas into some numerical uh, equations and then solved the system of equations. If we couldn't solve them, we didn't answer because we, did, we wanted to avoid the negative uh, number. But if we were kind of using the different multiple choices, we were able to make sure that some of them definitely are not working and then therefore remove some choices, then do 50-50 answer some questions. We didn't do that. Like we didn't use any human trick for answering uh, questions. Well, for example, probably less common in the geometry domain, but if you happen to make a natural language mistake that a human is very unlikely to, to make, yes. you may get an answer that isn't one of the choices. Sure, and sure. then you should just try again. Sure, sure. So no, we didn't leverage the uh, uh, multiple choice. Yeah, that's a good idea. And actually, uh, like about 30% of our errors are natural language errors, very good observation. And some of it is not like we don't understand the sentence. The, the hard part is how can we make co-references among different sentences? Like for example, it was talking about different lines and then it said each other. We didn't know which of those two lines. So, and and there, so these are one category of question. Then there were 30% of question that they were really complex and they required external knowledge. Like it was saying a polygon is hidden under a piece of paper. It is an obvious thing for a child to know what, what was happening there, but our system uh, didn't have any idea. Yes. So, so uh, can you uh, say uh, more about the scalability problem? Because one thing is that if I have these you know, SAT problems, there are so many practice problems, and they're all going to be so similar, and they're all going to apply the same rules and the same patterns. But kind of in the knowledge, there's also things that are less common, occur less frequently, and can be applied. So on one hand, scalability will slow things down, but on the other hand, can capture kind of some of this less, uh, less popular uh, information. Sure. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, Magda is asking uh, my view about the scalability. Uh, and uh, how, how the trade-offs. So that's absolutely right. And uh, so one, one first thing that I showed you was how can we do faster reading of the input? Uh, I'm saying we get similar accuracy in question answering. It, like we got good accuracy, but not like right, right, our number is about 85%. We got something around 83%. We thought that is fine to make two, 2% 2 mistakes, but at the same time, be faster, be able to kind of uh, read the text faster. So I, I completely agree, there are definitely trade-offs. Like, like this kind of same trade-off exists between uh, the complex reasoning and being more specific uh, to um, have wide coverage at the same time be very gen gener generic and general. So like, I think it really depends on the application domain. Uh, but, but again, one direction that I really like to pursue is the following. Uh, so right now, when you have uh, in Google search engine, when you search something, it will give you a really quick response because they probably hashed a lot of, uh, they have a lot of indexes, they can easily find the relevant documents. But if we really want to have a good understanding of the meaning, it will be hard just by looking at the hash from the document level, I mean, you know, like document level hashing probably is very high level, right? What if we can go a little bit in, more inside a document and hash a different uh, words in the context? So for example, I have something like Barack Obama was 44th president in 2009. I want to hash information about Barack Obama, one with respect to the 44th and what with respect to 2009. Now, if it, the question asks me, um, where, uh, 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 where, like, uh, who was the president in 2009, I can easily do some dot products uh, between the vectors that I hash and also what I've got uh, in the question. So I, I can be able to, I mean, be very accurate, but at the same time, make it much faster, especially go from linear time by reading the text, uh, the, the whole question in the text to kind of log linear time, if I can uh, be a smart in hashing stuff. How, how much interpreter is really important in this domain? I mean, when you give an answer, would you want the users to understand their reasoning? And sure. Are you, are you working on that part? So, so Soin is asking how interpretability is important in uh, especially these neural representations. A absolutely, it is very important. I, f I think interpretability 
and explainability are two topics very relevant to each other, but not exactly the same thing. I might even uh, be able to explain some of my rationales of how I decided uh, to choose this uh, answer, but still, uh, my models are not that interpretable. I highly agree that if they are interpretable, it's much easier for me to explain, but I might be able to get around it without interpretability, I can still explain stuff. And, but I agree, this is a very important direction. I am mainly focused on explainability than interpretability, but uh, I agree, those are both very important. So for example, we have done like one common practice in languages to visualize where the attentions are going, or for example, uh, where, how, how, like look at the, like uh, look at, go to lower dimension and see how the words that are similar with, with each other are close together and if it makes sense. So I have one, one quick question, if you if you sure. let me. Um, so uh, so you may have already answer, answered this when you answered Dan's question, um, but imagine that uh, you could get the best NLP group in the world to work on one problem uh, and really move the needle on it. Um, would it be co-reference resolution? Would it be something else? What what would what would help you get move the numbers on one of these tasks? Um, I would say. Uh, understanding multiple sentences together. Co-reference resolution is part of it, uh, but kind of this sequential understanding, I, I think it is important. Like some version of discourse. Some version of discourse, right? So, so for example, now nowadays we are doing a really good job on like sentence level understanding, but like understanding the whole stories together or how things are connected with each other. That's actually gonna be the first thing toward kind of being able to do multi-hop reasoning and complex reasoning, how to connect different things together. Okay, I think okay. we are out of time. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.